there are many pressing issues about digital health technologies and the future of healthcare. That's why we reach out to you on our social media channels to ask for your insights and questions. We did that a few, few weeks ago and you sent us many questions. So I thought I would answer a few of them in a random order and we will see how it goes. This is Bertala Meshko and you're watching the channel of the medical features. With AI refined to a level where our homes will be converted to patient rooms of the future, what will future healthcare buildings constitute? Only treatments and surgeries? That's a good start. I think hospitals, if patients become the point of care, can become like wellness centers where we go to rejuvenate ourselves or we, we go when we have to use big, huge, expensive machines, CT scans, MRI scans, and also medical professionals working in teams. We need a place where they can discuss these issues together. Maybe that's how it could change in the future. Is there going to be a need to physically see a doctor in the future or patients will be the ultimate point of care? That's my favorite line. You stole my favorite line. The promise of digital health is to make patients the point of care. If we can make it happen, I think healthcare is doomed. Although it doesn't have to mean that we will never see physicians in person anymore, but I think based on the fact that about 5 million healthcare workers are missing from systems worldwide and we will never train as many as we need, we won't have the chance to see physicians for every even basic health problem that we have. So first we will have to interact with them remotely or through chatbots and then when there is something we have to discuss live, then we can meet them in person. How can digital health improve the relationship between the consumer and healthcare provider? Well, in a way that it creates an equal level partnership. Now in healthcare, we have a hierarchy. We have the semi-gods, physicians, and we have patients who are told what to do. That's not a relationship. But with digital health tools and better social media applications, we can make them discuss these issues, share responsibility and share the decision-making process, making the whole team work together as partners. That's how I think it can improve the relationship. Who will pay for digital health solutions? Patients, public payers, private payers? Yeah, who will pay for that? I always get this question. Right now, there are two kinds of systems worldwide. There are nationalized healthcare systems where you get access to care, but there is, there is no money for innovations. And there are systems with private insurance systems where you can have a great insurance plan and you get all the innovations you want. But if you don't, if you're not wealthy enough, then you get you know, you lag behind in health and that's, that's an ethical nightmare scenario. So the way it can change is that if we share more and more data, we should get rewarded for living healthier lifestyles. That's one scenario for health insurance companies. But we can't let them use the same data against us as employers and uh, insurance companies shouldn't be able to ask for, for example, results of genetic tests. So the line is thin, but it's clear that we have to let them use data to reward us, not punish us for unhealthy behaviors. Do you think with human beings replaced widely, healthcare would be as productive as needed? I'm not sure human beings are being replaced widely. I'm sure that some roles will change. I'm sure some new jobs will appear, but the, the changes in healthcare due to new technologies is not about replacing people. It's about letting them do what they do in the most creative way, in a creative freedom, not doing any repetitive tasks every day, just doing those things that require the attention of a human being. Do you think that a future surgeon still needs to be a medical doctor? Or will it be something with superb motoric skills? I think both. That's why at some universities worldwide, at some medical schools worldwide, now they teach here, video game skills to future surgeons because they will have to be able to work with surgical robots as well as with the traditional methods. But it's about letting them enjoy what they do and do it at a higher level and not replacing them with simple robots. Algorithms work according their, to their programming. If an error happens, how would the safety of the patients be guaranteed? Like today. There is someone responsible for that. If I listen to your cardiac and lung sound with my stethoscope and I hear something in a wrong way and I make a bad decision, it's not the responsibility of the stethoscope, it was mine. So even when algorithms will be used in decision making, the responsibility is going to belong to doctors. What is your vision for the future role of medical affairs as our industry increasingly moves towards a drugs treatment plus technologies based solutions? I believe that if digital health is 
playing out right, then we will move, we will shift from treatments to prevention. And that's a whole new business area for pharma companies as well. We will have to use digital tools, uh, applications, devices, even medications to prevent diseases from happening. So I can't imagine that the business model will stay the same, focusing on treatments when we have a disease already. We have to focus on preventing the disease from taking shape. That's the real essence of digital health. Why do doctors dislike electronic health records? Because those are not really user-friendly and they are, they are forced to do administration in 60% of their time with a lot of screen time instead of having eye contact with the patients. Of course they hate that. They, they, I think they consider that this is the, the single reason why they hate parts of their job because they have to work with such bad system. But that's just user interface. It, it can be improved and we can use even better algorithms in the background to let physicians have a real life discussion with patients why these repetitive tasks like administration are being taken care of. Other instances where the cost benefits due to virtual care are actually being passed on to the customers. I've never seen something like that before. I've seen studies showing that in certain, under certain conditions, telemedical services can be cost efficient, but I'm not sure if we should, you know, categorize them like this. Telemedical care must be an absolute everyday part of providing medicine and healthcare worldwide because we can train as many doctors as we need, but we need healthcare professionals attention with many problems. So telemedicine should be at the core part of it. I'm not sure if customers should pay for that individually. And then, uh, do you believe in the singularity of artificial intelligence? I'm not sure if it's a religion to believe in. I believe that if we reach artificial super intelligence, then we are doomed as humanity, but let's hope we don't get that far. Let's stop before artificial general intelligence so we can enjoy the benefits of artificial intelligence, but we don't have to fear that the Terminator scenario becomes real. That was challenging. Thank you so much for these amazing questions. And the best part is that I'm available online 24 hours a day. Please feel free to ask questions about the future, about technologies in healthcare on LinkedIn, um, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook or Instagram. And let's discuss how digital health plays out. So thank you so much for these and I'm looking forward to your next questions.